looked at the physical layer of the 2.4 gigahertz and the, and the 5 gigahertz. And that's what we will be talking about primarily when we discuss why the 2.4 gigahertz has some advantages or why the 5 gigahertz has even more advantages. So to begin the presentation, my name is Trent Cutler. I've been with Medigeek for five years. Medigeek started out creating a USB spectrum analyzer, which uh, was able to show all of the energy uh, on the Wi-Fi channels. So it really helped people troubleshoot interference issues for Wi-Fi networks. And because they were using this USB Wi-Fi, uh, USB Wi-Spy dongle to troubleshoot Wi-Fi networks, we developed some Wi-Fi scanning software, which most of you know uh, as Insider. And Insider was great because it was, it gave people the ability to see the signal strengths of all of the access points, as well as see how the access points overlap in the 2.4 gigahertz. And taking that data into the spectrum analysis software helped people kind of see which networks are going to be affected by the levels of interference we're seeing with the spectrum analyzer. So we took it all, we put it into software called Channelizer, and that allowed people to record the network data and the spectrum data simultaneously. And if you want to learn more about that, we do have a visual spectrum analysis webinar. Uh, it looks like a third of you, well, uh, you know, around a third of you have actually attended that. We also do packet analysis now, and Packet analysis with 802.11 frames is a little bit different than uh, packet analysis on the Ethernet side, and that's because we don't really care about the application data itself. We want to see how much of the, how much of the frames are being allocated to management overhead, or how many of the frames are uh, being duplicate duplicated and retransmitted over and over again. And look at those ratios with some different software than Wireshark that really brings out. Uh, wireless issues in the 2.4 or 5 gigahertz bands. Lastly, I, I am kind of the su subject matter expert at Medigeek Foresight Survey Applications. I've had a lot of experience with VisiWave uh, and Echohow and Tamograph and all of these tools. That, these are the tools where you upload a floor plan and it will allow you to map out the signal coverage on a floor or on a map. This is really nice for finding those areas of dead zones or or access points overlapping and causing crosstalk. The site survey applications are a great uh, accompanying program for those of you who are doing Wi-Fi scanning or spectrum analysis or packet analysis as well. So let's get started. Uh, we're going to start off comparing the 2.4 gigahertz, kind of the pros and cons, to the 5 gigahertz, the pros and cons. And Immediately, I want to show the differences in the spectrum. So we're taking, like I said earlier, we took all of the insider data and we implemented it into spectrum analysis software. And spectrum analysis software is going to show you client activity. So if there's a lot of clients transmitting on a particular channel, you'll be able to see that. And you'll also be able to see non-Wi-Fi devices as well. So if you notice right around here on Wi-Fi channel 11, so this is channel 11 here, we see that it's more bright, it's more green, and we actually see some red areas. So this shape that we see here, this is, this is Wi-Fi saturation, okay? And the more green it is and the more red it is, that means the more constant the noise is. And because wireless is half duplex, that means if there is saturation, you and I aren't going to get a lot of time to transmit data on that particular channel. The safer channel in this example would be channel 11, where it's not as bright, it's not red, and it's not green. So in the 2.4 gigahertz, we see a little bit more saturation than we do in the, in the 5 gigahertz down here. And if you look at the differences, we see a lot of greens and a lot of reds in the 2.4 gigahertz, and we don't see any of that in the 5 gigahertz. The 5 gigahertz is a lot less saturated. There's not a lot of activity going on. So it's, it's kind of a safer choice. However, the, let's go over the 2.4 gigahertz in, in greater detail. The 2.4 gigahertz is going to have greater indoor range. And that's because the 5 gigahertz, when it's indoors, when it hits a wall, it's going to attenuate quicker than the, than the 2.4 gigahertz. The 2.4 gigahertz is home to 802.11 B, G, N devices. So really, that's a lot of all of the Wi-Fi enabled devices you see, most of them are going to be here. All the home wireless routers are, are primarily 2.4 gigahertz only. 
and a lot of the devices that we see now are 2.4 gigahertz only. So when we see the congestion, the 2.4 gigahertz, that's because primarily a lot of the consumer electronics only do 2.4 gigahertz. However, this shift is changing. We see the iPad supporting 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. We see smartphones supporting 2.4 and 5 gigahertz as well. So we are going to see a little bit of a shift into the 5 gigahertz where we'll see more congestion there. The 2.4 gigahertz is plagued by non-Wi-Fi interference. This shift is also changing, but in the early days of wireless, uh, basically they allowed any wireless device to transmit in the 2.4 or 5 gigahertz. And, the two, and since the 2.4 gigahertz had a little bit better range, everyone decided to go to the 2.4 gigahertz first. Unfortunately, in the 2.4 gigahertz, you only have three non-overlapping channels, and you can kind of see that in my image here. We have one here, we have channel 6 here, and we have channel 11 here, and these are the non-overlapping channels. So if there was interference on any of these channels, you that only leaves you two other channels to choose from. In the 5 gigahertz, we have greater performance, and that's primarily due to the lack of congestion. So if you think uh, about a channel in the, in the same way uh, as a pie, instead of sharing a pie with 30 friends, if you had a pie all to yourself, you would be a much, you would be much happier. Well, the same thing is true with wireless channels. If you're not sharing it with as many devices, you are going to have faster speeds. So the five gigahertz is going to at for this time at at this time we are going to have greater performance in the five gigahertz. We're also going to see 802.11a and AC capable devices, so the newer technology is going to be in the 5 gigahertz range. The 5 gigahertz has 24 non-overlapping channels. Uh, some of you will say, well, I don't have that many channels to choose from in the 5 gigahertz. That's because there are some provisions uh, which uh, disable these channels from being used if your equipment cannot detect radar. So if there is radar or weather radar in these, uh, in these ranges, then you cannot use that. And the 5 gigahertz is also going to have lower indoor range. So again, like we talked about earlier, the 2.4 gigahertz can go through walls a little bit better than the 5 gigahertz. The 5 gigahertz is going to uh, hit a wall and it's going to uh, not propagate as far as the, as the 2.4 gigahertz. Okay, so let's talk about what Insider shows. Insider is a great tool. It's, it's a Wi-Fi scanner that shows the signal strength of your access point, and it's also going to show the, the adjacent channels that are going to cause overlapping interference. And we call this adjacent channel interference, and what that really looks like is we see a network that is overlapping our wireless network here. So this is our wireless network on channel 1, and we see a, a we see another wireless network that's on channel 2 and it overlaps ours by 75%. This is going to cause interference and it's, it's quite problematic in the 2.4 gigahertz so the best, the best option is just to say I'm going to use channels 1, 6, and 11 and we'll get, we'll get into that in a little bit greater detail later on. Insider can also show you where you might have co-channel interference, so if you're sharing a channel with another network, you'll see that here. And it's also going to show you which channel doesn't have any overlap or uh, co-channel interference. What a spectrum analyzer is going to show you, uh, and this is, this is kind of showing you the raw in RF energy, uh, it's going to show you the spike of activity that comes on the same frequency of a wireless network, so you won't see this with Insider, and I'll show you how to avoid that. So this is an example of what a spectrum analyzer is actually going to be able to show you. You'll see the insider data that we see in, the, in this example with the network drawn here. And then we also see the spike of interference using the same frequency range as that wireless network. So the 2.4 gigahertz is, is plagued, with that, plagued by that. And why interference is a problem in, in the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz is as follows. The wireless is half duplex. That means only one device can transmit at a time. So when we have one device, he sends a, a data frame to access point or, or vice versa, and they have to respond with an acknowledgement saying, yes, I received that frame. But they have to wait for their turn to talk. So the more devices you add into, onto the channel, it's going to look something like this. You have, uh, you're, tr you're transmitting something to, towards an iPad, and all the other iPads in the wireless network are waiting for that. 
So when we talk about why the 5 gigahertz has greater potential uh, than the 2.4 gigahertz, and that's because there's less congestion in the 5 gigahertz channels. There's not as many devices that are currently utilizing utilizing the the 5 gigahertz range. And then we also have things that are not Wi-Fi that could be causing collisions, uh, transmitting and causing collisions on the frames that are being transmitted. So what that ends up being is we don't even see the frames because they became corrupted and we have to send them again. So the 2.4 gigahertz has a greater problem with interference, overlapping wireless networks, and saturation of Wi-Fi networks. Whereas the 5 gigahertz, we don't see as many Wi-Fi devices. You have more channels to choose from in case there is interference and you can jump to a different channel. To summarize all of that, uh, we talked about co-channel interference. So this is where you have a lot of devices on the same channel. Okay, and all the iPads are going to transmit, the access point is also going to transmit, and they each have to wait for their own turn to talk. The adjacent channel interference, this is when we have a wireless access point on channel 4, we have a wireless access point on channel 6, and we also have a wireless access point on channel 5. All of these are going to overlap on top of each other and cause interference. So when, when these devices transmit at the same time, they're going to cause collisions. And because they're not on the same channel, they don't know how to wait for, their, for each other's turn to talk. 2.4 gigahertz also has non-Wi-Fi interference, so cordless phones, Bluetooth, microwave ovens, wireless audio devices, all of these don't even talk the language of Wi-Fi, so they don't even wait for their turn to talk, they'll just go. And, and this is where you'll see dead zones or dropouts or um, disconnectivity issues, and it's due to non-Wi-Fi devices. In the 5 gigahertz, you have one less type of interference, and that is the adjacent channel interference. The adjacent channel interference is only in the 2.4 gigahertz where we see overlapping wireless networks. In the 5 gigahertz, we do not have the overlapping problem. So you have uh, networks that can be on one channel, and then you have eight or nine other channels to choose from. And in some cases, if, you, if your equipment can avoid radar, you have 24 channels to choose. So there is co-channel interference, however, most of you will be able to, to determine if there is another network on that channel, and if there is another network on that channel, you can avoid it. And then you can also avoid non-Wi-Fi interference by uh, using a spectrum analyzer and choosing a channel that will avoid it. Okay, uh, someone asked, some of my neighbors seem to have an auto jump between channels. Will, will I cover that? That's a good question. Uh, and and we, I don't cover it specifically. And, that, and what that is is basically they set their, their access point to, to change channels automatically. And the, unfortunately, the technology that's used for selecting the channel is not great. And they're all different per vendor. And the way that they choose a channel, it's arbitrary. And it may jump onto your wireless network because another channel was bad and it may cause interference. There is no way to really avoid neighbors jumping on the same channel. And if they jump on the same channel and, and it slows yours down, maybe you should talk to them and work out a solution where you say you're on this channel, I'm on this channel, and help them configure their, their access point. But for, for this presentation, that's, that's a little bit beyond what we, we are going to get into. Uh, but yeah, have a conversation with them and, and recommend a channel for them. A lot of people don't understand wireless like we do. And I think I think if we can create a happy medium for everyone involved, everyone's going to be happy with fast, faster Wi-Fi. Okay, so here is a, uh, this is actually, it, it's, it's a very cool program uh, that I used to do this. This, this program will generate uh, simulated uh, access point coverage. And what you do is you kind of upload a floor plan and you're able to build the walls over the floor plan so I can say there's brick wall on the outside and there's uh, drywall on the inside and there's a bookshelf here and and I'm going to place an access point right here okay and one of the things about Wi-Fi is the further you, further away you get the lower your signal strength and we all know that when you have one bar your 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 speeds are going to be slow but we don't really visualize it in this sense where when you are sitting outside at the edge of the coverage area you are getting 1 to 11 megabits per second okay that's very slow when you are talking that slow 
it, it is exactly as I say, you are talking very, very slow. And since wireless is half duplex, you are making every single person wait for you to finish. You are the slow kid in the back of the classroom that everyone is waiting impatiently for them to finish saying, okay? And I, I like to say the slow talkers are the slow kids in the back of the class because that's exactly what's happening. Uh, this person at the edge of the wireless network coverage area, they are talking very, very slow, and they slow down the, the performance for everyone else. To, to accommodate this a little bit better, the, the solution is, is not to beef up the power of the access point, actually, because what that's going to do, it's going to bring, in, bring, bring it into the yellow area. We really want this person to have fast connections, because when they have a fast connection, they are actually going to uh, talk faster and get on the channel and get off the channel quicker than if they were talking at one megabit per second. We want this person to have a fast connection of 150 megabit per second so we're going to add another access point here so we can have coverage of green where this person is standing so another access point is is going to one relieve the entire network of that slow talker okay and this new access point that we put in we're going to use a different channel and we're not going to have an overlapping channel we're going to put it on a different non-overlapping channel so when we plan our wireless network we're going to separate them channels 1, 6, and 11, okay? And this reduces the amount of co-channel interference. If you notice, my channel 1 net access points are as far away from each other as possible, as we can see here. And I've eliminated, eliminated adjacent channel interference by using non-overlapping channels of 1, 6, and 11, okay? So what I have now done is instead of using one Pi to solve everyone's problems, I've added another pie. So instead of sharing a pie with 30 people, I, I brought two pies to the party and 15 people get to split one pie and 15 people get to split another pie. So that, that's how you would uh, plan uh, in the 2.4 gigahertz range. I also want you to mention, I also want you to notice the coverage area of the 2.4 gigahertz because now I'm going to switch the slide and I want you to notice where I drew that X. Okay, Where I drew that X is going to change with the 5 gigahertz. The 5 gigahertz doesn't have quite the range that the 2.4 gigahertz does. If you notice in the, in, the, in, in the 5 gigahertz example, if we were sitting where we were in the 2.4 gigahertz, we wouldn't have any coverage. And that's because as the access point goes through all the drywall that we see here, it's going to have less, uh, it, it's going to not propagate like the 2.4 gigahertz does. Okay. And we also know, notice that the, the amount of green area in the 5 gigahertz is significantly smaller than the, than the 2.4 gigahertz. But don't be fooled. Even though the green area is smaller, we have less devices that we have to share it with. So the likelihood of us getting faster speeds in the 5 gigahertz is much, much higher than, than in the 2.4 gigahertz. Also, in the 5 gigahertz, we, we, channel planning is much easier. We don't have to worry about overlapping wireless networks. We, we don't have to worry about co-channel as much because we have so many channels to choose from. So you can choose one of many channels to choose from and not worry about any co-channel interference at all. And the best solution for a wireless network is to implement a dual band solution. So a dual band solution, and, and don't be fooled by this graphic, uh, a dual band is not going to cover the entire area that we are talking about. It's going to have the same range. And in fact, in this, in this example, I have added a lot more access points, okay? And I've added a lot of access points, and what I did was I lowered the transmit power. So I had more green areas, because I don't like the red areas. The red areas mean people are talking very, very slow and slowing down the wireless network for everyone else. So instead of bringing two pies to the party, I brought seven. And I brought seven pies, and everyone in these rooms is going to have um, more time to talk. And I, use, I used alternating channels, so I, I used one, six, and 11 throughout the, throughout the floor. And I used dual band access points. So if you notice, some of these will say channel six and channel 40. Uh, and this one will say channel 11, and this one will say channel 52. So these dual band access points not only uh, provide access in the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, but you have throughput 
on the 2.4 and simultaneous throughput on the 5 gigahertz as well. So you're doubling the amount of throughput available. And it's going to help if there is interference issues, the client devices will automatically jump to the 5 gigahertz and avoid the interference in the 2.4 gigahertz. If they can see the 5 gigahertz networks, they're going to jump to those and use them and have a faster experience. So people that have an iPad or a laptop that supports the 5 gigahertz, they're going, going to be so impressed by the wireless network because it's less congested and you will see faster speeds. Okay, so uh, before we get into the live demonstration, I just wanted to kind of highlight uh, in in a in a real life example of what the 2.4 gigahertz looks like in my office. In my office, I'm in a five-story building with a bunch of small offices, and they all have their own wireless network. And these wireless networks uh, are all administered by each business, so I don't have control over them. And what I did was I did a Wi-Fi capture. Okay, and so this is the equivalent of sniffing all of the wireless packets going through the air in full monitor mode so that I get to see all of the traffic that is not mine. And I'm using a tool called IPA, which is created by Metageek. And here we can see that there are 27 SSIDs on one channel. And we see that there are 311 clients on one channel. So this is one channel or one pie for 311 clients and 27 SSIDs. Okay, and the experiment was I was going to to stream a video from an access point to my desk and compare the results from the 2.4 gigahertz to the 5 gigahertz. And I just really wanted to see, uh, I wanted to see kind of what levels of duplicates and retransmission rates can I expect in the 2.4 gigahertz versus the 5 gigahertz. So when we look at this example, we see we actually see a lot of uh, a lot of the bytes being sent. So about 40% of all of the bytes being sent are not this color blue. Okay, they are they're something else. And this this whole uh, circle that we see here, this is a multi-layered pie chart. So the innermost ring, this is an AP. And as we as the mouse hovers through uh, this this multi-layered pie chart we get to see the details of that client device. So right now I'm highlighting my MAC address of my laptop that was streaming the video, okay? And we can see these, these results over here. So when I was looking at the conversation that my, my MAC address was doing over the, over the air, we see that I had an average data rate of 11 megabits per second. This is very, very slow. I, I do have an 802.11n capable card but because it was having so many issues uh, communicating in the wireless because my air is so dirty, uh, it had to resort to a, a slower data rate. And then we also see that the retry rate is 37%. That means of all of the frames that I sent, 37% of them were duplicates. That means they didn't make it success successfully the first time, so I had to send them again. So my wireless network is very, very inefficient, and it's due to one, the saturation of SSIDs on the channel, and the saturation of clients, so the number of clients, and it's also due to adjacent channel interference. Now, if we were going to compare this in my, my office environment, which is, which is fairly dirty, we notice immediately that the multi-layered pie chart has changed. We no longer see 40% of it being allocated to uh, different types of frames. We, get, we see that my device get, takes up about 99% of all of the activity being done. So uh, I'm, really, I'm literally sitting here on this channel with two SSIDs and 43 clients and an overall retransmission rate of 9%. Okay? This is the exact same environment. However, in the 5 gigahertz, I don't have to worry about Bluetooth. I don't have to worry about wireless keyboards. I don't have to worry about wireless mice. I don't have to worry about the cordless phones or wireless, wireless audio systems. I have chosen a channel that is clear from all of that, and I'm not sharing it with 300, 311 people. Okay? And because of that, I'm able to use faster data rates. I'm able to transmit at an average effective data rate of 51 megabits per second. I'm also able to do uh, send twice or three times the amount of packets, and I also had a lower retransmission rate. So I'm a lot more efficient in the 5 gigahertz. I did the same thing, and I did it quicker, and I did it more efficiently.
So we're actually going to look at a live capture uh, using this software, and we're going to analyze some of the results that we see in my wireless environment. And give me one moment to get this up and running. If you have any questions about the slides so far, feel free to ask them. Okay, this software is called IPA, and the reason it's called IPA is because it looks like an eyeball, and the PA stack analysis. So it really is a tool called iPacket Analysis. Someone asked, uh, let's see, what happens when a client sees two access points at the same time? Uh, clients are always seeing two access points at the same time. Uh, if you mean two access points with the same name and same uh, same SSIDs, what happens? Well, the client is always the one that makes the decision which one it wants to connect to. And when it makes that decision, it then sends uh, either a reassociation request or an authentication request in which that access point will listen and be like, hey, this packet is meant for me, and it responds. So uh, that happens a lot in corporate environments because they have lots of access points. and all the decisions of which one it connects to is made at the client level. Okay, so we're looking at IPA, and this this software it, it's similar to Wireshark if you're if if you've ever used that. In fact, this software is fully compatible with Wireshark. So at any point, you can export to Wireshark and bring it back in uh, and go back to to IPA if you need to. Okay. What the the most important piece to this is the USB device called an AirPCAP NX. And the AirPCAP NX is specific hardware that can capture two spatial streams, channel bonding in the 2.4 or 5 gigahertz. And so in the software itself, I can actually say, let me look at the 2.4 or 5 gigahertz, and I can choose a channel that I want to analyze. So I'll choose channel 1, and I'll choose channel bonding, and I'll, and I'll put the parent up above since there is not one that goes below. And from here, we actually see uh, the file size growing a little bit. You know, my wireless environment is somewhat dirty, and we don't see a lot of activity. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up an application, and I'm going to stream some video on my, on my phone. Actually, my phone, my phone is currently, we'll see what my phone connected to in one second. So I'll click Stop Capture, and what happens now is IPA, this, this software, is going to parse it three times. And it parses it the first time, uh, it parses it the first time to count how many packets and see what the packets are doing. The second time it goes through, it's going to look at where the conversations are, uh, who's, who's sending data, and it lumps them all into a conversation form. And then the third time it does it, it calculates the amount of airtime that's being used. Okay, so the airtime is the most important uh, and best view in IPA because this helps us visualize the amount of airtime that each wireless network is taking up. Because if you remember, we talked about co-channel inter interference. These are all the other devices that are on the same channel. So in this example, we see that there are 28 SSIDs and 307 clients. And I'll circle, circle that so you can see it better. and an overall retransmission rate of 45%. That's, that's pretty high and very unacceptable. Okay, as I go through each of the, the SSIDs, I can see how much airtime each one is, is taking up. And we see a lot of them are taking up about the same time, the same amount of airtime. For this one, this one took up the most airtime. And part of the reason it was taking up the airtime, you can use your mouse to investigate that. And unfortunately, you don't get to see the, the hovers that my mouse, uh, that, that I get. I get a little tool uh, that says, uh, this is Asus Tech Computer, so it's an Asus device. And it had an effective data rate of 32.9 megabits per second and an overall retransmission rate of 25%. You don't get to see that, unfortunately, um, but that little, that little piece is there. and. Every, 
if if you hover if you hover over anything you get to see more information about whatever you hover okay what's most interesting about the airtime about 75% of this multilayered pie chart is purple okay and the purple represents management frames as we can see in this in this graphic here so let me So the purple represents beacons, probe requests, probe, um, probe responses, reassociation re, re requests. All these frames really help uh, client devices join and leave a wireless network. Okay, and the blue frames, the blue frames are what makes it back onto the Ethernet side. And when we look at this in terms of airtime, only this little slice here is going on to Ethernet. Okay. Part of the problem with each one of these slices is that these slices are transmitted at the lowest data rate possible. They're sent at one megabit per second. Okay, so if someone was talking very, very, very slow, they're going to use up an unfair amount of time, and we call this overhead. So these are just the beacons of wireless networks. They're just beaconing. They they're going to do it no matter what, but they're going to beacon at the slowest data rate possible. And so in the 2.4 gigahertz, if you have a lot of networks beaconing, you see that 75% of the airtime is going to be allocated to management overhead. Now, if we wanted to investigate MediGeekGen, there's a few things that we can do in this software. We can type in the vendor so, uh, or the SSID, so I'll type in MediGeek. And this is going to show me all of the SSIDs on this channel that uh, have client devices attached to them. So if you notice in the SSID column, we see several several devices here, MediGeek GN, and the primarily the large uh, the MediGeek with the most traffic uh, and and the fastest data rate is MediGeek GN here. So I'll double click on that. As I double click on it my associated data table is going to change. Now I get to view every single MAC address of every single client device that's connected to this access point. So I get to see who's talking the most, who's send, sending the most data, who's using up the most airtime. And here we can see that this Aces Tech computer uh, sent the most. So what I'll do is I'll double click on him. And here we see the Aces Tech transmitting a lot of data. And we can actually drill down to the packet level to see what those conversations look like once we get here. So as we go through uh, all of these these conversations, uh, this conversation, we can actually see the clear to send, the data act, clear to send data, and we can go through and see all of the, the relationships between the data and the control frames. So control frames are going to be colored in orange, and blue is going to be colored in blue. Uh, someone is asking about the speed limitations of AES versus TKIP, uh, if any. Uh, you know, uh, AES is a higher, uh, the, it's a higher encryption, which means it's going to take more, and that's why we, we do actually have TKIP. TKIP is is really uh, it's really meant for backwards compatibility of 802.11g devices, so non 802.11n devices, and they they did it because the hardware itself was incapable of working with WPA2 compatibility. Uh, so really, the TKIP is a weaker encryption, uh, and they're both going to uh, you know TKIP is going to be quicker, I assume, but really. Uh, AES is a higher level encryption and you should be using that anyway. TKIP is a little bit outdated and it's going to be the first to go when the encryption uh, is broken. So I, rec I recommend using AES uh, encryption. Just, just stay with the WPA2 uh, and, and go from there. So there is a, it, it's going to be uh, marginal at best in terms of speed limitations. Okay, so I wanted to uh, open up a capture that was fairly interesting. And if any of you have been to a large event where uh, there's lots of, uh, for example, like a trade show or a stadium, and there's a lot of people there trying to use the Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi is not very good. It's it's quite poor, actually. Well. Uh, 
I saw a, a wireless vendor uh, have 100 iPads streaming video simultaneously on the show floor. And that was, that was very impressive to me uh, because I wanted to kind of see how they were actually doing this because uh, at this particular trade show, the Wi-Fi is notorious for being incredibly slow and slow performing. And so what I did was I took the IPA software and uh, an ARP Cap NX and I did a capture. And I wanted to see... Uh, looks like my memory Let's see if we can get so I wanted to see basically uh, basically how they were streaming all of these uh, iPads and Instead of using the 2.4, they opted to use the 5 gigahertz instead, and that's because the 2.4 gigahertz was too saturated with Wi-Fi devices, and uh, they were able to put 10 iPads, as we see here, 10 iPads per SSID. So the SSID's name is iPad Demo 6, as we see in the table here. And if I double click on that, we're going to just look at the iPad data and each of the iPads and how much airtime each one of these took up. And IPA is going to be able to show you the data rate and the retransmission rate, so how many of the frames had to be duplicates when they were sent. And the nice thing about this example is uh, we were able to accomplish, uh, well, not we, this, this company was able to accomplish uh, faster data rates uh, because they use the 5 gigahertz. So we look at the data rates of each of one of these devices and they were able to do, uh, in some examples, 52 megabits per second in the 5 gigahertz range. So even when saturation in the 2.4 gigahertz is bad, the 5 gigahertz can be a completely greenfield option for new hardware and new devices. So instead of maintaining uh, wireless that's available for legacy devices, the 5 gigahertz can be a great place for greenfield fast Wi-Fi. And if we were to investigate one of these particular conversations of, between the iPad and the Wi-Fi access point, we can see that, uh, we, that there's data frames and then they've implemented the new block acknowledgements that are, are used in 802.11n. So instead of having to acknowledge every single data frame, they're able to send a stream of data frames, as we see here, and, the, and then a block acknowledgement. So they, the block acknowledgement says, yes, I received all of those data frames. Uh, you feel free to keep going on. And so we'll see streams of these data frames uh, without acknowledgements. So they reduce the amount of overhead necessary by sending multiple data frames and then acknowledging them only once. Does anyone have any other questions about this software? Great. So if you'd like to download a trial of IPA, www.metageek.net, it's a free 15-day trial. If you have 802.11 captures with, uh, whether from your access point or for, from your Mac computer or a Linux computer, IPA will open those up and you'll be able to investigate all the client activity on a particular channel. You'll, you'll see the co-channel interference. And if you don't have a way of capturing PCAP files of 802.11 data, you can, you can use an Air PCAP NX, which we bundle with the software, so you can save $200 by bundling it as well. The URL is www.medgeek.net slash products slash IPA dash oh, IPA slash download. Okay, so right now, if you uh, if you type that out, it'll do kind of like a give us your email type of thing. But if you if you add a download at the end of that URL, you'll be able to skip all of the registration. Little secret. If you have any any questions, feel free to email me. My email address is trent at mitigate.net. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, and there's resources available on our website mitigate.net slash support. You, you, there's resources that can help you understand uh, spectrum analysis, packet analysis, uh, interference, and some design implementations 
uh, you'll also see the software that I used in this in this presentation um, and again I'm happy to work with you so any type any type of questions you have um, please send them to me thank you all for your patience and uh, we'll talk again